Thanks, Tim. So the first speaker kicking off our afternoon session, we're going to be returning to practice, is Rod Hayes, who is a director at Caruso Sinjin. And he led the perhaps called refurbishment of Tate Britain, debatable if it's a refurbishment or not. Uh, was project architect for the Brick House. Uh, Rod has a lot of teaching experience. And I think what's quite interesting, you just finished an MSc in conservation. So I think maybe in a discussion, it would be really interesting also to hear a bit about the disciplinary boundaries between conservation and architecture. Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to have to run at this. It's too long. Um, I'm uh, going to try and talk about um, the relationship of teaching and practice, continuity and adaptive reuse, question of structure and material, project work and practice, all in 25 minutes. It's quite a tall order, Tim and Nick, but I'll, I'll do my best. And I'm going to do it in four parts. I'm going to talk about a situation that we're in, I think, at the moment. I'm going to uh, talk about the principles of what I'm going to call bubble and squeak architecture. Um, that, we, that name is today. I, it's a working title. I'm going to give uh, mostly with illustrations from 20th century art. Um, and then I'm going to talk about two case studies. And if we have time, I'll do sort of a postscript. So as I see it, the sort of situation that architects find themselves in is begins with a sort of unhelpful model of creativity. So I think model for most architecture is probably haute cuisine, sort of it, premium ingredients, specialist techniques, financial means, intensive, highly ordered things, extreme attempts at control and um, single-mindedness. They rely on a kind of connoisseurship, sort of 19th century legacy, very old, slightly mysterious model of creativity. Uh, a sort of master apprentice model. And that's uh, uh, reflected in practice, I think. It's pretentious, it's not terribly practical, it's quite elitist, it's falling behind a sort of epistemological reality where knowledge is democratized. In fact, knowledge is not sort of nearly enough. Knowing something speaking Latin is no longer the key to a sort of privileged professional position, I would say. So um, I think other skills are more useful, like seeing, communicating, drawing out, spatializing, process and chance, imagining, and imagining really as a kind of mode of judgment, which I think is, is why the word sort of testing has come to be used frequently uh, in teaching and uh, in offices. Um, but I also wanted, um, I went to a lecture in 2004, I think, in, the, in, the, in Tate Modern by Rem Koolhaas, where he, he said, it struck me, I remember it, he said, Europe is finished. And I, I can't, now I think about it, I don't know whether he meant Europe is finished, like it's complete, or whether he meant Europe is finished, like for get out. Um, so and I'm still worried about that. Um, so we practice almost entirely in Europe, all over Europe. So I do feel equipped to talk about Europe. So I'm going to only talk, I'm going to confine my talk only to Europe. And um, when he says sort of Europe is complete, it makes it sound like a monument, as if Europe's time has passed. But I sort of see it more optimistically that Europe is leftovers. And um, the idea of leftovers is a really interesting, like it, it's first used in 1890, that word. And um, uh, it gets used much more in World War I, as you might expect. So a really interesting idea of reuse of minimal waste. And I would say leftovers is not the same as bricolage, okay? So bricolage is a diverse range of available things put to use. But I think with leftovers, you have a sort of duty to make a new coherent whole. That is the wonder of Bubble and Squeak. And um, Bubble and Squeak is a good example, but I also came, you, I didn't know this, but almond croissants are leftovers. So you used to kind of take a croissant yesterday's croissants, stuffed them with almonds, baked them again, second bake them, and they had a second life the following day. I mean, terrific kind of resourcefulness. Um, but I don't think, I sort of think bubble and squeak architecture is not the, the architecture of a conservationist. So it's not only the product of retaining things, it's not even the product of sort of well-judged adding, it's transcendent. It's sort of more than the sum of its parts. That's what I'm sort of driving, I believe it, trying to believe, persuading myself, I suppose. And um, I could give you a more highbrow example, say jazz. Right? So jazz is a sort of amalgam of 
ragtime and blues. I'm sort of crucifying jazz and not a musicologist, but um, the sort of pressure to form something out of seemingly irreconcilable customs. So forcing a kind of innovation. And it's connected to, but sort of outside, I think, of traditional epistemological categories. I want to say jazz is hybrid. I don't think you can do hybridity in architecture. I think architecture is um, not abstract enough to be hybridized. So it's sort of bubble and squeak. Um, I also wanted to say that I think architecture matters. So somebody on a train asked me the other day whether I thought architecture was moribund. And I was completely taken aback by the question. I couldn't understand it. And then I realized that they were assuming that, every, that architecture is new build that they're the sort of same thing and therefore new build was over. And um, I think this burden to deal with the leftovers sort of has to affect architecture somehow. Architects are uniquely placed, I think, to speculate on the second life of buildings, of places, so other ways of living, because it involves a kind of technical reappraisal, a kind of programmatic reshaping, and it has to be spatially incisive. But architecture is constrained and architecture is, um, to a certain extent, opportunistic. I was thinking about degrowth, and I was thinking why degrowth doesn't underpin substantial construction projects. And even saying that, I was wondering if I'd get a laugh at that, even saying that is strange things, slightly comic, like degrowth underpinning substantial construction projects. Like, even now, there's sort of, there's such an elision of the idea of growth and the idea of change. And I think architects are custodians of change. I don't think of us as agents of growth. And um, yeah, why was I saying that? So, oh yes, I was trying to think of an example of a good degrowth project. So the villas in the Veneto. So the sort of turning away uh, with the discovery of the new world from imports to Venice from the east causes Palladio to sort of make this leap into a kind of new architectural idea, how to repurpose this landscape in a lower tempo economy. Um, and so I'm really optimistic that um, because carbon is actually a cultural problem, as well as a technical problem. Our kind of uh, embeddedness in a carbon economy is, is a cultural phenomenon, that architects might make a profound contribution to changing that because we have in the past managed a kind of cultural, to envision a kind of cultural change. Um, and I just want to say, for the last 30 years, we have been losing competitions by proposing retention of existing buildings. <laughs> so, I know it's sort of suddenly trendy, um, but it is, from our point of view, um, not narrowly just a question of energy, but rather actually a, a kind of really long-standing cultural problem. I think it's summarized really well in Amitov Ghosh's book, The Great Derangement, that we all have sort of unrealistic expectations, or even not even unrealistic, but kind of misplaced expectations of the, the package holiday and the space-time of the novel. Um, and they're kind of culturally pervasive, I think, about the workings of time, about questions of status, about our relationships to one another, and between human and natural things. And uh, architects, while they can give kind of embodied experience to joy and dignity and beauty and grace, um, I think they also need to start describing just decarbonized futures that people want to travel to a place that's kind of just out of reach from my perspective, and made of leftovers. So, uh, yeah, that's, that was part one. Uh, uh, part two. So I thought of some five principles of bubble and squeak architecture. So I'm gonna start with hyper-contingency. Um, I guess, I think, a hyper-contingent project would use yesterday's cabbage and it would never buy a waffle iron. So um, that's my first principle. So all projects are contingent on their circumstances. Of course they are. And um, their creative contingency emerges as a kind of open-mindedness or put the other way, as a kind of acceptance of dependency on their circumstances, not a fight against those dependencies to make some a priori project. And to a certain extent, I'm, quite, I'm sort of proud that all our projects look quite different from one another, although I do end up in arguments with people about that. But um, So in a hyper-contingent project, these dependencies are sort of generative, 
So if you describe a situation adequately or in a satisfying or ambitious or compelling enough way, you, your description becomes propositional. And it's sort of inevitable that those um, descriptions are partial and subjective and edited. And like all good work, you have to sort of recognize that subjectivity, I think, and acknowledge it and control it, which is why I started by sort of challenging this master-apprentice model, because, because I think that there's a problem with acknowledging uh, your subjectivity in those models. But I don't, it's not simply a question of ends, I think it's also a question of means and technologies. So it's not appropriate to specify in situ concrete in revolutionary France, because it hasn't been invented yet. And it's equally not intelligent to us for a tower crane in a farmer's field. So there's a kind of a, a judgment about money and energy and spirit in a way that is um, accounts maybe for the problems we see in super specific technique, something Peter Smithson calls things used once, maybe never again. Um, uh, and I think they sort of demand these very large amounts of energy for very small outcomes. Uh, the second principle of Bubble and Squeak architecture is a New Jersey state of mind. So that is uh, Robert Smithson's phrase. That's sort of falling in love, not just using yesterday's mashed potatoes, but actively falling in love with them. It's harder to pull off. Um, so I think that there's a capacity to delight in every situation of finding things of value or of meaning in every situation, of resistance to conventional hierarchies of significance or value, and to be suspicious, I think, of exclusionary underpinning stories about the world as we find it. And I think that's anti-utopian in spirit, really, that as a sort of celebration of things as they are, that projects could become an intensification of their circumstances. It does require a receptiveness I talk to my students sometimes about um, they're allowed to dislike places as lay people, but not as professionals, that somehow arriving at a place you're burdened with having, and you should enjoy and lavish upon a place a kind of New Jersey state of mind. Um, and the leftovers are kind of wondrous and delightful things. They're all worthy of attention. They're all capable of transformation. They should mostly find a place in the finished dish. But I'm, I'm urging you not to be silly. You know, don't put gherkins in a blancmange. So it's not a sort of question of everything goes in. I think there is still some editorial. Or maybe you make the building that's out of the blancmange, and then there's a separate thing out of the gherkins. But yeah, because nobody wants that kind of bubble and squeak. So uh, there is a sort of refinement required. The third principle is history as a quarry. Very familiar. But I'm trying to sort of describe it as um, not being resistant to finding a recognizable dish. Like I think, um, I guess, for how would I put that? So uh, Joseph Frank maybe puts it better than I would saying, use all things that are still usable. So I think there is a cultural barrier on the left that says formal radicalism is the same as political radicalism and that the ancien regime is kind of overcome by a brave new world. And Joseph Frank has this sort of argument with Lubetkin over and over about sort of that tension between whether formal radicalism and political radicalism are the same thing. But there's also a problem on the right, as you would expect, that history for the right is not a narrative at all. For the right, there's truth that um, even when usually that's not actually true. And I think there's a sort of nostalgic or a nostalgia for a conservative social situation, a reversibility of cause and effect, where if you somehow repeat a physical architecture, you achieve a kind of conservative sociability. And you certainly see that in the sort of reconstruction in the 21st century of the 19th century city in, in London, um, but with kind of different underpinnings. Um, and I suppose I think you can't unbundle this role of conditioning and being conditioned by. And I think there's a real problem, of course, of that kind of conservatives ruling out different ways of living now in the 21st century when our expectations are different and where our kind of impulses should change. And maybe there's a really useful uh, notion from music of the fantasia or the rhapsody that somehow uh, it gives you an invitation to examine or explore or extend another idea. So it's sort of, um, well, I quote uh, Kashka Napkovitz. Uh, 
We want to open up the cosmos to encourage fantasy and people need to use their imagination when they look at our work. If everything points too clearly in one direction, then you can only read the set text. If foreign worlds meet and then drift apart, that opens up different ways of seeing. Um, and uh, I just finished that bit, which is the hard bit, with uh, this quote from Herman Czech, which says, it is remarkable how little architects perceive of reality. The city itself is the existent. It is stronger than anything one can invent in its place. The more we comprehend it, the less we must stand in opposition to it. And it, the easier it will be to understand our decisions as a continuation of a whole. Uh, kind of fourth principle, speak the vernacular. So cooking like a grandparent, um, there's a really nice thing in, in, there's a really nice phrase in Made in Tokyo where uh, the vernacular is described as an intricate reporting of the concrete situation. So if the art of building is a kind of coming together of technology and availability and need and custom, not problem solving, then vernacular continuity might represent a kind of condensate or a crystallization of these parameters, like a real statement of the condition that the building finds itself in. And um, Peter Smithson has a nice way of, actually I think it's Alison and Peter Smithson have a nice way of describing it, which is scrutiny is no more than what was normal when making a farm or a fortress or a bridge. In the past, then, because of the effort, the hard work needed to make it, each part needed to perform and encompass many tasks. There had to be an interlock of actions, including the process of erection, even subsequent alteration. But to think like this now requires a conscious set of mind. Um, so there's sort of an intrinsic quality in things and then there's actions in the world from my perspective. And we could even have an expanded definition of the vernacular. So architecture of architects relates distinctions between categories, rationalizes physical structure, pushes preconceived use onto that structure and tries to be self-contained. Yet everyday life is made of transversing those categories. So that, that's a quote from Made in Tokyo. It could have been from pet architecture, kind of describing how the building is a crystallization of its circumstances. Of course, you can depart from the vernacular, but I think you should have an understanding of the vernacular because it accurately reports on social and economic circumstances that kind of act like a gravity well on projects that it's hard to escape, it requires energy to escape from a kind of vernacular gravity well. The last principle, run out of time, is um, time scale matters. So I think it's a fair question to ask who wants continuity with a racist, sexist, 19th century colonial project. And um, it's actually an inescapable thing we have to deal with, I would say. And I guess Walter Benjamin calls it the catastrophe of history, that you can't kind of escape that situation. And one way, link, way of dealing with it is to challenge, I think, one sort of time horizon thinking. So um, to ask yourself what a kind of period of continuity is, because you could say it's a hundred year timeline, but overlapping that is a sort of momentary, uh, ephemeral kind of time, but also a very long duration time. So I think our architecture should maybe have greater attention to ephemera and impermanence and maybe have a greater empathy for non-human things as a result and maybe a resistance to the idea of the finished monument or even a resistance to the idea that anything is finished, that everything is in a state of change and a sort of rejection of the myth of the monumental but persistence by other means which might mean we get better at caring for things and maintaining things. We might even accept Decay, we might find beauty in decay, we might curate decay, to borrow Caitlin de Silvey's excellent book title. Um, so I'm just trying to come back to uh, Bubble and Squeak. And cooking takes years and last seconds. So there's a process of cultivation, the cabbage, harvesting the potatoes, cooking them the first time, cooking them the second time, amalgamating them, eating them, the resulting compost, and it's recycling into cultivation, which I think slightly kind of undermines Cedric Price's use, reuse, misuse, abuse, disuse, refuse. And um, destabilizing the flow of time feels quite important to us, I think, in projects. The idea that history is directional or even that it's linear starts to become unstable, in which case it becomes easier to use all things that are still usable. So um, 
That was a long-winded introduction to projects. Oh, now I've got six minutes. <laughs> Some important names. I'll let those just sit there for a second. Um, nice people. Right, I've never done hospital theatre in three minutes. There's a terribly dry Architecture Foundation film. It lasts over an hour of me and Paula chatting on about hospital theatre. So if you really get into it, you knock yourselves out. It's not got many views. Um, <laughs> hospital field is a kind of wonderful, gentle place on the east coast of Scotland. Not the rugged west coast, the east Coast, and it's an enabling context, I guess, a sort of arts education, arts production place. It's been a powerhouse in Scottish art, art scene for 120 years. It's not a stately home, <laughs> but it is easy to mistake as one because it's an estate surrounded by farmland, encroached upon by housing, and it has this sort of strange interrupted relationship to the sea on the east side. That's what bit what the house looked like. So there are all these complex layering of historic artifacts it's sort of uncompromised, rare survival. It's not been turned into a national trust house. It's not a hotel. It's not a wedding venue. You know, it's not all these, it's sort of, it's not in private hands. It's a very, it's a very special situation, I would say, and has loads of very conventional conservation value as well as some kind of interesting, unconventional stuff. And it's a total work of art. So the interior, the objects, the paintings, the sculpture, they're all kind of one thing. And they really document the life of Elizabeth Fraser, and Patrick Allen Fraser, uh, both of them. And unusually, their lives are unusually palpable there, partly because Patrick died, left the estate in his will to be an art school, and it hasn't been changed. So I was there the other day, found Elizabeth Fraser's hymnal on the bookshelf. I'm not sure it had been opened for 140 years. So it's certainly dusty. Um, and it's been a site of a lot of fun. Uh, in the 1930s and in the 1970s, the so scale of teaching there has reduced over time, but it's still a place of production and conviviality, and there's a big effort to use the buildings in the way that they were designed to be used. Our proposal has five elements. There's a collection center. I'm going to do this. There's, uh, except I won't do that because I shake and I do public talks. So. Um, collection center, I guess. Here's my sister and I. Anyway, let's not get into that. Like essential tremor in front of 100 people. Anyway, uh, guest house, studios there at the back, uh, a fernery and a cafe, and a sort of walled garden. So those are, those are the five things that we're adding, adapting, changing in the, uh, in the project. And in the foreground is the garden, which is done with its fernery and uh, cafe and under construction of the studios at the back, and um, we're in development on the rest of the phases. So it's a very contingent project, opportunistic, uses former farm buildings as a footprint, it's consolidating existing spatial relationships, it's trying to extend the range of spaces that are possible there, different kinds of use, really, different kinds of art production from sort of 19th century space, 20th century, 21st century space, and how you could, as an artist, make work in that situation. But it's contingent in the sense of uh, overlapping little bits of wall and trying to kind of uh, settle itself into quite a complicated and difficult site. Uh, it has a sort of New Jersey state of mind. So obviously we fell in love with this place through drawing it, uh, through a sort of drawing every stone and trying to work out, particularly in the fernery, what was intentional and what was accidental because it's a sort of fantastical ruin which then fell into ruin. So a complicated bit of detective work. And um, yeah, falling in love with the kind of interiors as, as well, in a way, of, of those existing situations. And maybe doing some conventional uh, conservation. So we did paint scrape tests. We're going to redecorate the studio in the way it was decorated in the mid-19th century. Uh, except we're not, because some of the paint scrape didn't work, so we had to make it up, which is the best bit about paint scrapes. You can usually justify anything. So um, we kind of made, anyway, made this color scheme, which the conservation architect's a bit disturbed about, but anyway. Um, and it needs some TLC, as you would expect. So it's, this is the, uh, from 1901, a studio which we're insulating and doing all the kind of decarbonization things you would expect, moving them off fossil fuels and so on, and really trying to transform the internal atmosphere from one of freezing cold, where you sit next to a heater in the corner of the room, to one where your practice can expand, uh, even in the winter, when the days up there are really short. Um, 
So uh, that New Jersey state of mind gets us a sort of optimistic interest in fern mania that dominated the middle of the 19th century about theories of knowledge and kind of Victorian totalizing. But it also meant that we were treating history as a quarry. So we found this photograph of the greenhouse, this re-entrant corner, and then kind of remade it. <coughs> um, in this proposed situation. So the garden in the foreground is a recapitulation of a Tyrannesian, you knew that, of a Tyrannesian <laughs> monastery garden. And that, that's a sort of interesting, problematic kind of reinterpretation of the Arbroath Abbey's uh, genesis in the original building. So I'm running out of time. So uh, the vernacular. So the guest house is a timber building with a very familiar courtyard type, a kind of vernacular you might expect to find either maybe in uh, Japan, but maybe in a motel in the States. So it's a motel type with motel rooms or monastic cells, depending on how you look at it. And uh, the vernacular also applies to this little building tucked away in the corner, the kind of studio that's almost finished. Uh, so lighter, lower carbon, all entirely timber frame building, very heavily insulated, almost finished, and um, clad with these timber shingles. And lastly, timescale. So the timescale really matters. So uh, there's this very long understanding of the Tyrannesian tradition that affected that place, which Patrick Allen Fraser kind of added in these arts and crafts impulses, a rejection of globalization and mass production. And in a way, there's a very familiar image, I think, you know, I think Patrick Allen Fraser would understand the cutting of the ribbon, this sort of Victorian society. That's, yeah, I, I shouldn't do this. It's Mark Jones, Sir Mark Jones on the right hand side. Sir Mark Jones talking to everybody, just about to become director of the, interim director of the British Museum. British Museum yeah. And, but there's also this. So there's a guy, I'm not name dropping him. <laughs> I, why am I? It's sort of like, it feels like a very 19th century situation socially. And then suddenly it feels like a 21st century situation or a medieval situation where it's this depth of shadow, where there's a kind of medieval aspect of death hanging over the place. It's sort of haunted. They hate it when I call it haunted. But, and, and nature is kind of reclaiming it. And I think that those images, persistent images over time are something that we've tried to leverage in the project to remake those images sitting over one another and not simply being one or the other. Have I got time for another one? You sure? Yeah, very generous. Okay, so I, I talk about, oh yeah, I have to do the leaving the names. Okay, uh, I'll talk about Lille, amazing place. Uh, so why is this project contingent? Um, our project in Lille is to convert Fivesrael Babcock's factory compound, which was an enormous part of the city with an extremely hard wall, like something out of Lowry or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to sort of transform it, in, to invert it, really. So although it's contingent on its circumstances, it, it also tries to pull off a reversal of the urban idea. So instead of being a citadel, it's a kind of garden. And uh, a place of what, for a lot of residents of Lille, was a place of their childhood, because the factory closed in the 80s, but many people's grandparents worked there who still live in that neighborhood was a sort of slightly mysterious place they'd visited once on that day. What is it called? Go to work with your mum day or to, that day. You know, they'd visited once. And so there's very weird, interesting conversations with people about their sort of mysterious past of it, uh, not knowing what was inside. And that's what's inside. So it's as much about emptiness as building, this spatial structure of yards and ways, this unusual legacy of very large scale engineering. Uh, usefulness to these spaces that are sort of inside, outside spaces, really. And uh, we, uh, I think our project aims to leverage that spatial situation to be contingent upon it and yet to invert it and make these new connections outward to the city. And so the plan has areas of emptiness, areas of extremely high density teaching. It becomes part of a, uh, a lycée, a kind of uh, a food college, I guess. <laughs> 
And a food college doesn't really do a French gastronomic, lycée gastronomique. It's like a food college on another plane. Um, so it's areas of dense industrious learning. It's not simply conserving objects. And I think many of the politicians would have been happy to erase those objects, but it's also trying to preserve a spatial structure, spatial memory. And we took a kind of, with the help of David Grandorge, we took a sort of New Jersey state of mind, recording the existing circumstances of the project, trying to use them as a springboard for creative intervention in that place. And we really liked the vernacular, which is really a brutally skinny steel frame from the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, with these wafer thin brick facades. And, we sort of adopted, co-opted that into the proposal. So tried to repurpose all of those existing sheds into a new whole composition. So even the vernacular forms we accepted with the new and the old kind of uh, being in the same shape and uh, kind of connected to each other, if you like. And history is a quarry in this project in the sense that this infrastructural avenue is preserved this yard is repurposed for bicycles. This as a public passage, public passage through the, through the site. And that we sort of introduced gardens, which were maybe a recollection of the overgrowth that we found when we first arrived. And uh, there is a deliberate kind of chronological blurring, and that's achieved through pattern and color. So we're looking at new buildings in that image, but their pattern and their color is connected to the existing buildings. And then elements are added to existing buildings that reconnect them back to the proposal. So it's destabilized slightly. The technology is destabilized. It's quite an old technology. This, I don't know if this happens to you, but every time we specify something, it's just before it's phased out. <laughs> so it's a sort of lovely thing. And you just kept like the last of the species, the endangered profiled metal colors. Anyway, so maybe we're too nostalgic, but um, so that profile has been phased out. Anyway, so we kind of found these things and tried to be a bit ambiguous about whether they were from the 60s or whether they were from the 1890s or whether they were present, if you like. And that there's an ambiguous image of what came first, what's conserved, and hopefully that makes a new whole, that the sort of affiliation of things, but also of processes. So it sometimes feels optimistic, I would say, sometimes feels a bit post-apocalyptic with plants breaking through the floor and trees growing indoors. Uh, and it's inhabited seasonally uh, in quite a high key way sometimes. And um, we, we, the colors are the product of a kind of research project that we did into what the co old colors were. But like with the hospital field, we basically just chose the ones we liked because it sort of prove anything with that stuff. I wish I could show you the sort of chucking out of the factory, the chucking out of the lease, you know, when lessons end at 4.30 of flows of people coming out the gate, no longer wearing top hats, but kind of leaving school. It's wonderful. It's kind of amazing inversion of its urban impulse, really lovely. And I'm almost not gonna talk about this because I'm uh, uh, well, pushing my luck. That's the word, isn't it? So I'm just gonna say, we're doing it now. This is happening now. It's quite interesting. All the principles I've just enunciated are sort of happening in this project too, uh, different scales and in different ways. And I hope it gets built. Thank you very much. Thank you.